Hey everyone, it's Beverly Hallberg. Welcome to a special pop-up episode of She Thinks, your favorite podcast from the Independent Women's Forum where we talk with women and sometimes men about the policy issues that impact you and the people you care about most. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Hadley Heath Manning, Director of Policy at Independent Women's Forum and your host for today's special pop-up edition of the IWF She Thinks podcast. 100 years ago today, Congress took an important step towards women's suffrage by passing the 19th Amendment and sending it to states for ratification, which ultimately took place in 1920. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about that passage through Congress with Heather Higgins, who is our chairman at Independent Women's Forum and the CEO of our sister organization, Independent Women's Voice. Heather also serves on the National Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. So welcome, Heather, to the She Thinks podcast. I'm delighted to be with you, Hadley. Um, so first, I want to hear a little bit more about this uh, commission. Tell us, you know, about the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission, why it exists, what its goals are, and uh, sort of how you became involved with this. Uh, the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission uh, was, I believe, originally conceived in uh, 2015. Uh, going into 2016 uh, by various women senators as an opportunity, knowing that the centennial of suffrage was coming up in 2020, to create a a national commission that was authorized in legislation to be bipartisan and to try to help uh, figure out how best to celebrate and raise awareness of uh, the centennial of suffrage and what it meant Uh, educate people historically about it. Um, And so uh, there were various people in the legislation who were designated, for example, uh, the head of the Park Service or their designee, the Library of Congress, the National Archives, the Treasury. But then you also had appointments that were to be made by whoever was the president, uh, the speaker, the leader of the Senate, and their Uh, parallel minority um, pairings in the House and Senate. Um, And so Paul Ryan uh, designated me as one of the two people that he, as speaker, was uh, allowed to uh, designate. So on June 3rd, uh, the commission had uh, another meeting as we continued our planning. And on June 4th, uh, that, of course, is the centennial of the, uh, the the passage through the Senate of the amendment, moving it out of the House and Senate and into the states for the ratification process. Um, well, I'm I'm curious to ask one question, and it's a historical one, um, because the House of Representatives, when they voted on the 19th Amendment, um, as well as the Senate. Those votes were not unanimous. In fact, I think that the vote in the House was 304 to 89, and the vote in the Senate was 56 to 25 in favor of the amendment. So it passed, but there was at the time in 1919 um, some resistance. You know, today I think it's sort of very widely accepted that American women should have the right to vote, and, and the right to vote should be protected in this constitutional amendment that's been on the books for almost a hundred years. So what were some of the arguments historically, you know, at that time against women's suffrage and, and what were some of the reasons that lawmakers might've given at the time for not supporting the 19th amendment? Well, it, it actually goes way back before 1919. Um, you actually had a lot of push uh, starting in 1948 in Seneca Falls uh, I'm sorry, 1948, 1848 in Seneca Falls. Um, and uh, the the women's suffrage movement then got very much caught up with uh, the abolition movement. Uh, both were drawn from the same wellspring that all people were should be treated equally in the eyes of the law. And therefore, one of the many things that they were arguing for, which included property rights and, and a number of things, uh, should be suffrage. Uh, so the women's suffrage during the Civil War era tended to um, 
decline as a focus as everyone decided that they were all going to get behind the abolition movement. Uh, and then uh, the history, which people should read about, is quite interesting. There was a lot of tension after the Civil War uh, because uh, there was a decision made by Frederick Douglass and others that you probably couldn't get suffrage for um, African Americans at the same time you were getting suffrage for women. And so you had the 14th Amendment and the, then the clarifying 15th Amendment, and both of them were talking about men but leaving out women. Um, so then you move forward and you finally get to the 19th Amendment, and interestingly, a lot of the push against suffrage came from other women, and they argued that women didn't want the vote. Uh, they feared the social change that suffrage was going to bring. Uh, they saw it as likely being a harbinger of the losses of the privileges and protections that uh, women had gotten as a function of being, quote unquote, the weaker sex. Uh, they worried that... Um, that one of the key things that was important for men was to be responsible for women and uh, that this would see eventually an increase in divorce rates and forcing women into the labor market rather than being able to just be at home and be supported. Um, they were worried that political responsibilities would overburden women who were already terribly busy um, and that it might in some ways actually adversely impact the respect that they felt that women already had. So, for example, there was concern women were very much involved in a lot of philanthropic and charitable and reform activities in the educational and civic areas, and they were felt to be above politics and therefore have greater standing and credibility on these issues precisely because they didn't play in the political realm. It's an argument actually that's very similar to that advanced by charities today. They don't want to be able to give money to politicians because then they worry that they're going to get co-opted and pressured and will no longer have the status that they have. So those were some of the arguments that were being made uh, in opposition to women's suffrage. That's that's a fascinating history. You know, I grew up watching Oh gosh, Schoolhouse Rock and the sort of animated videos. And there's one called Suffering Till Suffrage. And it's just, you know, my school book education about the 19th Amendment um, left out a lot of the nuance. And it was just, um, you know, it's, it was a pretty simple um, story about, you know, obviously women's suffrage ca came to be and there were these bad guys who opposed it. But it's fascinating to learn more about the context of the time and, you know, what happened just just prior to women's suffrage in American history. And I also think it's a fascinating history just in the previous 100 years, because, of course, this vote on the 19th Amendment wasn't the first time Congress voted on a matter pertaining to equality. Um, you mentioned, you know, the abolition movement, the end of slavery and equality between the races, but also between the sexes. I mean, there were debates about not just the, the right to vote, but other women's rights as well. And this was far from the last time that Congress would vote on a matter pertaining to sexual equality. Um, so what would you say, Heather, uh, about the, the progress that American women have made over the course of the last 100 years um, since the 19th Amendment, working um, towards even more social, political, and economic equality. What would you say about sort of the status of American women today and the progress we've made since 1919? I think it's indisputable that uh, we have made progress, at least for those of us who define progress as being able to choose the life path that you wish to choose and not having it be predetermined uh, where and what is appropriate for the choices that you make. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't challenges. Um, some of the predictions do, in fact, seem to have come to pass. There are women who would rather not be in the labor force who have to be, but I think the same can be said of men. Um, there is an increase in the divorce rate, but it's not clear to me at all that that is a function of being able to vote. Um, so that I think that there are a lot of other forces going on. Uh, and the big fight, I think, that is, that is looming ahead of us now is understanding that being equal is not the same thing as being the same. Uh, 
and that there are, in fact, very legitimate protections for women in law um, that are very important to many women and that they would like to hold on to. And so pretending that there are no differences between males and females, uh, when in fact the biology and the neurology are pretty clear that while we are equal, equal in terms of our aptitudes and our intellects, et cetera, there are in fact real differences and respecting those and the choices that they may drive uh, is an important one. Right. And, and, you know, you mentioned how, how busy women were in 1919. This is something that I think about pretty frequently. I have two young children. And of course, it was more common for women to have even more children 100 years ago. And I have vacuum cleaners and washing machines. And I think often about just how, you know, we all, male and female alike, have benefited from so much innovation and, and wealth today. So in, in some ways, we have it easier. But we, we still, we continue to face sort of these complex questions about what are the, the best public policies to uh, enhance people's freedoms, choices, and opportunities? And that's, that's part of our mission at IWF and IWV is to, to advance those policies. So my next question is, what can we right. do? And I, as, should just, oh, and I should just add ahead. right along those lines. Um, one of the things I, I think I forgot to mention was, you know, there were people who were saying that women were not temperamentally suited to vote. And that they were just too emotional and they couldn't, they weren't informed enough about politics and the events of the day. And they weren't informed enough about business or commerce um, or war since they weren't really involved in any of those things and therefore they shouldn't vote. But there were enough women and men, interestingly, there were a lot of men who favored suffrage, Mm -hmm. um, not always for the best reasons, Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there was a nativist element that thought that this, you know, giving more women the vote would essentially double the vote of the uh, already here population versus yeah. all those people who were getting citizenship and coming in from overseas. Um, and so that may not have been the best reason to give women the vote, but it, but all those things did play into it. And I think that you and I would argue that women are perfectly capable of making intelligent, rational decisions, um, yes. <laughs> not just emotive ones. In fact, all human beings are subject to being a little bit um, emotionally driven in their thinking, but you can also sure. sit them down and be completely rational. Yes. Yes. Well, that, uh, that, kind of gets back to the the question I was going to ask you next, and it is about the modern context. So we at IWF and IWV, we talk frequently about a lot of public policy issues. We talk about different ways for um, women to be influential in these debates, um, whether it's, you know, as a candidate for public office or as a, you know, a fellow mom at a book club or whatever our daily lives, you know, however we participate in in society and in the economy. But I wanted to ask you, particularly as a, a member of the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission, what can we do today as American women to honor the suffragettes and uh, to celebrate this centennial of their hard-fought victory that affords us now um, the right to vote? I'm so glad you asked me that. And I'm so glad you asked me that the way you did, because one of the things that I learned that I had never um, appreciated before I came onto this commission is that the term suffragette Um, refers to women in the suffrage movement in Britain. And uh, when Alice Paul and others came over, having watched the attempts to get suffrage in Britain, they wanted to distinguish the American suffrage movement from the British one, because in Britain, women were being actually quite violent, and they were doing things like breaking windows and even doing things like throwing themselves onto a racetrack in front of oncoming horses. One woman got herself killed. Um, And it was, so the term suffragette had been uh, developed as a term of derision uh, in Britain. They eventually came to own the term, term and accept it. But in this country, we refer to them as suffragists. Uh, as distinct from the ones in Britain who are suffragettes. So I had never known that. And it's an interesting piece of history to also watch how the two different movements evolved. Um, There are so many things that can be done. Um, At the state level, governors can issue executive orders of commemoration. Legislatures can do, you know, their joint resolutions. 
um, one of the the totemic symbols of the movement was uh, the, not only the color white, but uh, gold. And so uh, I think that there are a lot of plans to bathe capitals in uh, gold light, uh, both for uh, the anniversaries of when they pass their individual um, approval of the amendment, uh, as well as on the actual uh, people argue whether it's August 18th, that's when Tennessee um, approved, which is technically the date when they got the 38th state and they were ratified. Um, or the amendment was ratified, but it was also confirmed in Congress on August 26th. Um, so both days are recognized. Um, generally, the emphasis is on the 26th, but, but both um, have historical validity. Um, but if people want to do more, you know, uh, organize their community to have gold fireworks set to the Battle Hymn of the Republic, um, which, by the way, was written by Julia Ward Howe, who was a suffragist. Uh, there can be film screenings. If you have parades, do floats or wear uh, suffrage paraphernalia. Um, dressing in white uh, is a significant thing if there's a, a, an anniversary of a, a date that you are celebrating. Um, organized community murals or races that have a suffrage theme, debates and essay contests, book clubs, planting yellow roses because that yellow gold theme is a, a constant. Interestingly, people who were opposed to suffrage wore red roses and people who were in favor of it wore yellow um, and certainly using social media. And these ideas and many, many others can be used to celebrate um, the anniversary of suffrage. Wow. This is all I'm I'm learning so many facts about history and I'm thinking I'm so glad to have learned the suffragette versus suffragist distinction. It sounds like a question that might come up on on Jeopardy and one person who comes up actually quite frequently as a Jeopardy answer is Representative Jeanette Rankin and I've seen you you tweeting about her she's the first woman in Congress so that's that's just a tip for anyone who yeah, watches she Jeopardy. she was a Republican, and they're leaving exactly. that little detail out. <laughs> yes, yes. Much well, of if, the uh, suffrage movement was actually driven by Republicans, as was the civil rights movement. But that is lost in, in the inconvenient details of history right. for the present narrative. Right. Well, so. any just a tip for any avid Jeopardy viewers like myself, Jeanette Rankin comes up quite frequently. <laughs> yes, um, and she see. was a... Of not only the first women, woman in Congress, she was there four years before women got the right to vote uh, yes. nationally. She was and, from a Western but, state. Uh, Wyoming, yeah. actually, as a state, gave women the right to vote early. So there, were, yes. there had been individual states that were doing it, but uh, there was the decision in 1919 that they really needed to do this nationally. Right. Right. Well, Heather, in my, in my last question, I just want to ask where our listeners might find out more information about the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. And, um, of course, I'm happy to tell them where they can find more information about Independent Women's Forum and Independent Women's Voice. But um, please tell us where we might follow you on Twitter or learn more specifically about the Centennial. Well, the, the place to go is the Women's Centennial website, which has just recently gone up. Um, they've done a heroic job of putting it together in very short order, and so it's already got a lot of material, and it's going to have a lot more with great, not only educational materials, but also ideas for people on what they can do to uh, promote this. And uh, the website is uh, all one, one word, no spaces or underscores or anything, womensvote100.org. So W O M E N S V O T E one hundred dot O R G. Thank you, Heather. And uh, for our listeners who do want to learn more about Independent Women's Forum, our web address is iwf.org. Uh, this is the Independent Women's Forum She Thinks podcast. We have many editions of this podcast. Typically, we release a new episode every Friday. This is a special Tuesday pop-up edition. I've been speaking with our chairman, IWF, Heather Higgins, who's also CEO of our sister organization, Independent Women's Voice. Their web address is iwv.org. Heather serves on the National Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. We've been 
talking about uh, the important passage through Congress of the 19th Amendment. And I'm sure as we look forward to 2020, we will be talking more about the centennial of the ratification of women's suffrage uh, through the 19th Amendment. Thank you so much, Heather, for being our guest today. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. 